Um, so, so I want to, you guys to think about how do we get to this picture here? This picture is from the New Yorker. It's, it's MLK kneeling with Michael Bennett, who no longer plays in the league and also Colin Kaepernick who, who no longer plays in the league. And this is a, a long, long, long journey. Um, to, to cut this journey short, because we, we have so much time, I want to start in the post-World War II world, right? And I want to start with, with this picture here. Um, this picture is from a, from a Black newspaper, the Michigan Chronicle. Um, most of my quotes you'll see, most of the, if, if you see a picture and it's not taken from the web, it's, it's generally from a Black newspaper. Uh, um, I, for when I, when I wrote the book, We Will Win the Day, which you can probably see right over my shoulder, right there underneath that Public Enemy album, um, it's all, it's about 90% black newspapers. And so it's just me looking through black newspapers from 1945 to 1968 and just trying to recreate this story. And I love this, this, this political cartoon because it, it really shows you the meaning of what folks thought of sports in the black community. This is 1947. Um, and it's this idea that sports and democracy, right, are, is the best way to represent democracy. And it's important when we think about the context of World War II. You're either webcam or the people can capture video or what they see in your computer, whether you're there or not. Um, <laughs> somebody's is not muted in this. Okay. Um, Well, there we go. So everyone got muted. I'm not muted. So anyway, I love this political card. It really showed you the investment black folks have in the uh, sports. And, and, and part of this investment is trying to show white Americans, right, that, that, that you can accept a black person, right? So whether it's uh, a Joe Lewis or a Jesse Owens, right? Black Americans are looking to these athletes as, as, as a way to prove something. And you see this here in this uh, quote right here. I took this again from, from a black newspaper. Um, this one happens to be from the Cleveland Call. And what they're suggesting is that sports are a powerful uh, tool of democracy in the United States. They say it may not be as intended or as it should be, but the righteous truth is that the doings of a Joe Lewis or a Jackie Robinson have more gripping and moving effects on the thinking of the majority of people than all of the long studied and wise words of a W.E.B. Du Bois, a Walter White, or a Philip Randolph. Real quick, Walter White, that is not Walter White of Breaking Bad. That is Walter White, who was the, the head of the NAACP. But you can see it here, this, this black writer is saying, look, what a Joe Lewis does or a Jackie Robinson does is, is more important because white Americans see this and perhaps they'll accept this, right? You have to understand America is Jim Crowed right now. And so desperate times called for desperate measures. And, and the black athlete is seen as somebody who could shape the civil rights movement. Now, at this moment, for most black athletes, they just wanted the athlete themselves and black press and the black community just wanted them to represent black America. So you'll see it in some of these quotes here, right? Um, someone like Althea Gibson. So if you don't know uh, Althea Gibson, she is the first black tennis player to win um, Wimbledon. She actually wins it twice in 1957, 1958. She wins the French Open in 1956. Um, and, and what people call Althea Gibson is a community project. That is to say, these two black doctors saw her play, brought her in <clears throat> to their house, um, got her, how do I put this, got her right, right, in the sense that <clears throat> Althea was a troublemaker, she she never went to school, they made her go to school, they made her clean herself, you know, just, you know, act proper and, and, and all this stuff, understanding that Althea was going to be the, really the middle class Blacks way of proving to whites that they belong, and, and she wins, and there's a huge celebration, and Althea knew what they wanted, right, and she says, I'm not a racially conscious person, I'm a tennis player not a Negro tennis player. I've never set myself up as a champion of the Negro race. I feel strongly that I could do more good my way than I could be crusading, right? So she's saying, look, I'm just going to play tennis and that's it. White America will see me and that should be enough. I don't have to be a political leader. My role is to be an athlete, a good athlete, a good person. You'll see in these next two quotes from Willie Mays, right? One of the greatest baseball players ever saying essentially the same thing right? Like, <clears throat> if I carry myself right, that will help the next guy 
the next black person down the street get an opportunity not a famous person but just a regular person now now willie famously when when the giants moved from new york to san francisco couldn't get a house right and the mayor had to step in because <clears throat> the seller wouldn't sell it to willie mays who was the most one of the most well-known baseball players at that time because he's black but here in 64 you see willie mays saying the reverend martin luther king can't play baseball so he doesn't try now how would i look trying to preach to people I try to do my best within my abilities and think I've helped my people. I don't criticize the movement person or action because I'm no statesman. I'm only a ball player. Again, for most black athletes, 40s, 50s, 60s, until the mid 60s, that's enough. But I think you start to see also around the same time post-World War II, a change. And, and some in the black community say, you know what, we need more. And that change, is going to start with Joe Lewis. And to me, it's surprising because Joe Lewis, if you don't know who Joe Lewis, you should. He's the greatest boxer of all time, right? A heavyweight champ from 1937 to 1949. But Joe was set up to be the person who represents Black America and, and, and that person who does it in such a way that other Black Americans will, will get an opportunity after, after him, right? He is, he is clean cut. He's the heavyweight champ of the world. After that, you know, going into that Max Schmeling fight, the second fight, he loses the first one in, in 1936. But going into that second fight in 1938, you know, you have some white Americans, Americans just celebrating him as, as an American, not a black American, an American. And, and the black press and the black community took to that. They understood what it meant. They understood when Americans celebrated him giving money to World War II or having the famous slogan, we're going to win this war because we're on God's side, right? In fact, there's a book that comes out in 1944 and it's simply titled Joe Lewis American. And that's who he was. But what's important here is that Joe Lewis by post-World War II America, while he's still the heavyweight champion of the world and, and you know, he's on the decline, right? He understood that no matter how much people celebrated him, there's still work that he needs to do. And you can see it here in 1947, it's from Salute Magazine, which is a military magazine. I just took the cover off. Um, it's my toughest fight. This is Joe Lewis all about how he wants to be Jim Crow, the last thing he wants to do. And we think about this is amazing, right? He'd been heavyweight champion for 10 years. And the only thing that his, that's on his mind right now, obviously paying his taxes, which he did do, but defeating Jim Crow. And if we go to this next picture, I took this next one from um, the New York Age, and, and, and which is a black newspaper in obviously New York. But here it's a column right before the election of 1940. Now, now Lewis goes Dewey and, and he loses, and, and Lewis will remain a Republican throughout his, his life. Um, but here he is talking about the virtues of democracy and the importance of voting. And I, I think this is important to talk about because here we are, and I'll get to it at the end, where, where someone like LeBron James and other black athletes over the last few months have stepped up to, to help right, people get registered to vote or to help people vote. And, and I think um, the stats, something like 300,000 people actually voted at sports arenas. And Joe's the, really the first black athlete to, to talk about the importance of democracy and, and getting everybody involved in the, in the election. And Joe will, will really set the template for, for my favorite, Jackie Robinson. Um, I love this photo of Jackie Robinson. It comes from, again, a black newspaper. It's democracy in action. It's all Americans. And, and I like using it because it shows the hopes of, of black America, this idea that we might just be one uh, black baseball player, but it's enough to prove the point that America, right, even though we're a Jim Crow nation, can do the right thing. And I like pairing it with this quote right here from 1962. It's the end quote from Martin Luther King as, as King writes a letter about Jackie Robinson um, as Jackie gets into the Hall of Fame. And, and I love it because it says, you know, Jackie Robinson insistently raises questions to sear America's consciousness. Some have challenged his right to ask these questions. He has the right, more rightly, because back in the days when integration wasn't fashionable, he underwent the trauma and the humiliation and the loneliness, which comes with being a pilgrim walking the lonesome byways toward the high road of freedom. He was a sit-inner before the sit-ins, a freedom rider before the freedom rides. I love this because King is celebrating Jackie Robinson as somebody who didn't hold back, 
somebody who understood that he had this important platform being Jackie Robinson, and he was going to use this, right, to go right at America about racism, about police brutality, about Jim Crow, about lack of voting rights, right? And then there's King acknowledging really how hard that journey was for Jackie being that lone, isolated figure for so long. Um, and, it, and it's just a call to, to let other people know really how hard you know, being a pioneer is in, in the civil rights movement. But on Jackie and his, his civil rights legacy, you know, it starts for him in 1949. If, if you remember about Jackie, um, Branch Rickey famously asked him, you know, to cool it, you know, when he signed him uh, because he didn't want Jackie Robinson, not to, not to ruin the moment, but, but to allow white baseball players and white fans to see that if Jack, if you get under Jackie's skin, then, you know, it's the experiment's over. You can get under all their skin. So, so he stayed quiet for a couple of years, but here in 1949, you see him starting to open up. And, and 1949 is important. This is in front of what we call HUAC or the House of American um, Activities, Un-American Un Activities Committee. And they brought, Congress brought Jackie Robinson up in front uh, to denounce Paul Robeson. If you don't know Paul Robeson, uh, one of the great actors and entertainers of, of his generation, certainly one of the most famous black people in the world at that time. and. At that time, Robinson um, said that if there was a World War III, Black Americans wouldn't fight in it. And Congress went, whoa, what do we do here, right? The most famous Black person globally is saying Black Americans aren't going to fight in a potential World War III. So they countered that with Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson denounces him. But Jackie took the time to say, look, just because, right, this, these charges come from a communist, right? doesn't mean that there's not discrimination, right? Doesn't mean that there's not police brutality. Doesn't mean that lynchings aren't going on, right? So Jackie Robbins is saying, hey, wait, 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 you want me to denounce him for saying that Black Americans won't fight in the war, but I want you to know that you have an obligation to, to deal with police brutality, right? To deal with Jim Crow and lynchings and everything that impacts our community. And from that moment on, Jackie was really relentless at going after America about, you know, Jim Crow, right? About the police brutality. Um, my favorite Jackie quote is from 1963. You can see it here on the right side. And he says, we must keep these youngsters aware. And especially we who have been fortunate, like Floyd, Jesse, and myself. So he's talking about Floyd Patterson, Jesse Owens, and obviously himself, that no Negro has it made, regardless of his fame, position or money until the most underprivileged Negro enjoys his right as a free man. I think that's so important. It's this least of these approaches that he takes. And it comes on the hills of Birmingham. Essentially, if you remember Birmingham with Bull Connor, uh, Jackie Robinson and Floyd Patterson, who at one point is the heavyweight champion of the world. And, and at this point, he's actually training to fight Sonny Liston. And, 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 and Sonny Liston will knock him out. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen that fight, he actually beats him twice. Um, but he goes to Birmingham. There's some, there's some riots after uh, King's Motel is bombed. And he's there to, to check out the situation, to calm folks down. And Jesse Owens goes after him and, and essentially calls him an outside agitator. And, and Jackie said, no. You know, I'm here. It doesn't, I'm famous, you know, Floyd's famous and, and, and we're here to help out, right? Because I understand that my freedom is tied to this person here in Birmingham. And I love that approach of, of understanding you're perhaps the most famous person, black person in America, one of the most famous Americans, right? And still saying that's not enough, right? Because that doesn't mean anything if this person in Birmingham is Jim Crow. And, and we see Jackie, what he also does is Jackie um, uses his platform in a newspaper. And so he'll have a newspaper call. Um, I, and I picked some of these out. I can't show all his columns just to highlight who he was, right? And just to kind of highlight this conversation about police brutality and, and black athletes speaking out is nothing new. Jackie's out there, right? And, and he, this is from an article in 64, Watch That uh, Cop Brutality. It's not the first time he writes one. It's, it, I just love the headline. And this is actually after, after Harlem, 1964 Harlem. And he warns, right? If this doesn't stop, right, there's going to be more riots. So there's a, a, a riot in Harlem. And he warns there's going to be more across America. And he's right, right? 
between 64 and 67, there's more than 100 riots in America, famously Detroit, um, and then New York happened in, 60, uh, Newark happened in 67. Then you have 100 more after King's assassination. Politically, Jackie, if you're interested, <clears throat> was a, what we'll call a moderate Republican. He's more of a Rockefeller Republican. Um, and so here in, you know, in 60, he goes Nixon, but like he's holding uh, Kennedy accountable to civil rights, right? Um, but then in 64, he's coming at the GOP, murder, hate, and violence will be weapons of the new Republicans, right? He's warning, he's using his platform to warn the Republican Party that this, this, this road of, of courting Southerners and not Black folks, then you're going to change the party. Because at this time, you have to remember, there's still a number of Black folks who are part of the political por uh, Republican Party. I believe about 40% went Nixon in 1960. Now, that's going to shift by the time LG LBJ gets there. But here's Jackie warning them. Um, and then I love this quote from Jackie Robinson. We can't do all of Jackie, but this quote is so important to today. And he writes this at the beginning of his autobiography, I Never Had It Made, right before his death. He actually dies in 1972. He says, as I write this 20 years later, I cannot stand and sing the anthem. I cannot salute the flag. I know that I'm a black man in a white world. In 1972, at my birth in 1919, I know that I never had it made. This is Jackie saying that he doesn't stand for the anthem. He doesn't salute the flag because of how America treats black Americans. I want you to hold on to that because we'll get a similar right, thing from, from Colin Kaepernick famously in 2016. But Jackie's so important because he showed athletes that you could be more than an athlete, right? That you could be successful, but also, you know, privileged, successful, but also like challenge America about racism. And after Jackie, you'll see slowly athletes getting involved and being celebrated for that. And so here you have Elgin Baylor in, in, in 1959, who when he was with the Minneapolis Lakers, boycotts a game in West Virginia because him and the two other black teammates are going to beat Jim Crow from a hotel. He said, you know what? I just won't play, right? And he says, I love basketball. I like playing in the league very much, but not at the expense of my dignity. Um, the next quote that you see in the middle is from a black newspaper celebrating, right? This is an act that even Jackie Robinson might have hesitated to pull, right? And then you have Jackie Robinson celebrating this, right? And, and I think Jackie's celebrating this because he's like, finally, I'm not alone in this moment, right? I have another black athlete coming to my side, willing to be part of this civil rights movement. And then the next year, you have someone like a Mudcat Grant. And this is a one-off. If you don't know who Mudcat Grant, one of the great pitchers uh, yeah, at 1.1, uh, 20 games. But here in 1960, actually gets suspended by the Cleveland Indians the last two weeks of the season because during the playing of the national anthem, he says, this land ain't so free. I can't even go to Mississippi. Right? Upon hearing that, his pitching coach, who, who was a known racist, got mad at him. And, and essentially, Mudcat Grant, I believe they'd say, called him the N-word. You know, they called Mudcat Grant the N-word. He leaves, and he gets suspended for leaving the field before the game plays, and nothing happens to the pitching coach. But I love this quote at the uh, end. It comes from the St. Louis Argus. It's a, it's a black newspaper. It says, this is 1960, and the entire picture has changed. What he's saying is that there's a new movement going on, right? This happens in September. By this time, you have the full sit-ins movements from college students from, from February 1st, 1960 until this moment. You're all going to have about 70,000 students, you know, black and white, participate in the sit-ins. And what's going to happen is that when you have this really beginning of a larger civil rights movement, not just confined to you know, what's going on in Montgomery, but through, throughout the South, it's going to give these athletes who maybe were reluctant to get involved in the movement to get involved in the movement. And by the early 1960s, you'll have the, the real the birth of the activist athlete, right? So before that, you've had, you know, that sprinkling, that, that you know, Jackie here, Joe here, little Elgin Baylor. But by the 60s, it seems like most of them are, are getting involved some way. And part of that is the role of the civil rights movement, right? If you're that isolated figure like a Jackie Robinson out there, you're going to take a lot of heat for speaking up. But now all of a sudden, and we see this today, if there are more people out on the street, you're just part of that movement, right? So you feel comfortable, or they feel comfortable being involved. The other part about this is that it gives them the cover to speak out, 
but also seeing what happens in the civil rights movement give them courage to participate. And the third thing is they're being pushed out there by the black press. And, and I love this. It's in the middle of this quote I pulled out, 1963 newspaper. It says, Negro athletes give the impression that they consider themselves exempt from the civil rights fight. The truth is, however, that no one except the lame, the halt, or the aged is excused from the struggle. That's how serious and important it is, right? So you are an athlete. You've benefited from this fame you have something to give back and you have to do it. And these athletes internalize it. Floyd Patterson, who at one point is the heavyweight champion of the world, it says here, he's watching TV and he's watching these young kids, the, the, at this point, it's the freedom writers getting their head bashed in. He's thinking, man, like how lucky am I that they're fighting for me, but I haven't done anything. So I'm gonna do something about this. So after watching these young kids participate in the civil rights movement, Floyd Patterson at first gets a, you know, a, a full-on subscription, a, a membership to the NAACP, but that's not enough for him, right? He will help integrate Miami sports. Um, he has a heavyweight fight in 1961 and says, look, I'm not, if you don't integrate this arena, then you owe the NAACP $10,000, right? And, and the promoters don't want to lose money, right? It's in his contract. And so they integrate the arena and Miami's integrated after that. And Floyd, he'll pay uh, the NAACP out of his own pocket. But the other things that he does is, is he goes to Mississippi with Jackie Robinson and Kurt Flood and Archie Moore to, to, to encourage civil rights activists in, in Mississippi, one of the most dangerous states at that time. He's with Jackie Robinson in Birmingham. Along with Jackie Robinson, he tries to buy, um, create a housing complex to, to um, integrate housing for, for, for Black folks. So he's totally into this movement. Another person we might be familiar with here is, is Bill Ruffle. And I just picked two of these quotes from newspapers uh, because I think they speak to who he was. And then this top, this one on my left, I don't know what you're looking at, it should be your left. He talks about why he gets involved in the civil rights movement and why he, he talks about civil rights. And part of this says we have, to, we have got to make the white population uncomfortable and keep it uncomfortable because that is the only way to get their attention. So this is his way of using his platform. And, and it is to consistently speak about civil rights and a lack of rights black folks in America have in order to make white folks and really white fans who follow them uncomfortable, right? So they'll be willing to do something. If my favorite player is saying that there's a problem, I got to do something. That's what he hopes. Here, I like this quote. Um, it just says Russell would give up basketball for rights. Essentially what happens is he goes to Mississippi in 1964 to put on a clinic and people are worried that he's going to get killed. And, and he essentially says, like, look, I'm, I'm willing to do this, right? Yes, but only if it would make a concrete contribution. There'd be no choice. It would be the duty of any American to fight for a cause he strongly, strongly believes in. They're asking him if he would give up his basketball career, right? He's, he would give up his career just for folks to have civil rights. That's the type of commitment you see in these athletes. And it's not just the famous ones, the ones we know. It's, it's people like, Mal Whitfield, who, who's Olympian in 1948 and 1952, two-time gold medalist. In Ebony Magazine in 1964, is telling black athletes, boycott the Olympics, right? Civil rights hasn't come to America. But they're just going to use you. Boycott the Olympics. Now, nobody listens to him in 1964. And in fact, by 1968, when there's a, a boycott movement on the horizon, he, he'll say, like, he had it wrong. But this is just him saying, look, man, we have participated for America for, for a long time, right? Whether it's someone like a, a Jesse Owens or him, himself or, or, a, uh, or, um, <clears throat> or, you know, a Floyd Patterson or, you know, um, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting her name from, from 1960. Lynch, so I'll get back to it in a second. But we participated and we're, and we're still Jim Crow, right? Wilma Rudolph, we're still Jim Crow. Enough is enough. Don't go. They don't listen to him. But still, you see that athletes are, are willing to, to put it all on the line. And you have here football players, the 63 Raiders, um, the black players, there's only four at that time, said, so we're not going to go play in this exhibition game in Mobile, Alabama, because the, the stadium is, is Jim Crow. And in fact, what happens is the Jets and Raiders who are supposed to play in this exhibition game cancel the game because black players are uncomfortable. 
1965 AFL. So before the there's the NFL. There's I mean while there's the NFL in 1960s, there's the AFL, and they have a lot of black talent. 22 players from that, or 21 players from that from the All Star game leave New Orleans and said, we're not playing in this all-star game because of the way we're treated in the city. You promised us we wouldn't be discriminated against. We're being discriminated against. We're not playing. And so they wind up moving to Houston. Right? So this, this activist athlete bug has impacted every aspect of sports. And then there's going to be a, a significant shift. And we see that shift with, with, with Ali. Uh, this quote is from Malcolm X. It, it says that Clay is the finest Negro athlete I've ever known. The man who will mean more to his people than any other athlete before him. He is more than Jackie Robinson was because Robinson is a white man's hero. Now, to be clear, Malcolm X and Jackie Robinson did not get along, right? Jackie Robinson was an integrationist. Malcolm X was a separatist, right? And so the two didn't mix. He, he, he frequently called Jackie Robinson Uncle Tom, and, and, and which, is, which is crazy because Jackie Robinson was, was someone who, who fought, right, and who, who was willing to give his life and his career for, for civil rights, right? Um, but by this time, this picture is, is just a, a small moment in time. I believe there's a movie coming out. Uh, it's called One Night in Miami about the time where right after uh, Clay slash Ali wins the heavyweight championship, defeating Sonny Liston in 1964. It's, it's Ali, Malcolm X, um, Jim Brown, and I believe Sam Cooke. And it's kind of, they're talking about civil rights and, and black America. So that's supposed to come out in December or, or January. So, so look, look to that. But Ali changes everything because when, when America finds out that this young kid who, they don't like because he talks too much. He's too braggadocious. They call him the Louisville lip is all of a sudden flirting with the nation of Islam. People go, Whoa, this is different. This isn't just Jackie Robinson saying something about civil rights. This is, you know, a top heavyweight contender and then the heavyweight champion of the world, part of a separatist organization, part of an organization that has not, not necessarily doesn't want anything to do with civil rights. Doesn't want anything to do with, with, with America. Right. And, and, and what do we do with, what if, what if others start to, to act like this, this kid, right? And so, you know, we got to come after him. And you can see this from Ali. I love these quotes here. And, and, and Ali's really explaining to himself, right? Um, this is 63. This is really where, where folks really start to get uh, scared by, by his politics, right? He says, I have no use for organizations like the NAACP. I'm a fighter. I believe in an eye for an eye business. The NAACP can say, turn the other cheek. But the NAACP is ignorant. You kill my dog, you better hide your cat. I mean, this threw a lot of folks off because they just thought he was just a, this annoying kid. All of a sudden, now he's, he's political, he's radical, right? And, and later on, you know, a couple of years later, they asked him, right, why does he do this? Well, this that's when he comes Ali and he says, I've heard over and over how come I couldn't be like Joe Lewis or Sugar Ray, so that's Sugar Ray Rubs. Well, they're gone now. And the black man's condition is just the same, ain't it? We still catching hell. And what he's saying is like, you can ask me to be silent. You can ask me to be this perfect figure. But those who came before me who were silent, who were, quote, unquote, this perfect figure who tried to show white America that, you know, we're okay, it didn't work and we're still catching hell. Now, what happens with Ali is really a warning to other athletes on the one hand, but also will inspire a new generation. We'll talk about the report of that. The athletes, as as many of you guys know, that Ali is is his draft status changes right to a one A status in, in in 1968, and he gets drafted. Bef between 1964 and 1966, he didn't have to worry about that. He didn't score high enough on the aptitude test, but the military changed the score the level that he to get in because the war is is picking up in, in Vietnam, and and Ali will famously say, "Look." The, the Viet Cong can never call me the N-word, right? I don't have no problem with it. My fight is here. And so as you guys know, the government obviously comes after him and Ali refuses induction. And between 67, 1967 and 1970, he, he can't fight. And I think that's a warning sign to other athletes what, what will happen. And we'll see more of this when it comes to someone like a John Carlson, Tom Smith, or Court Flood. Those ones who completely revolt from the system they get punished and it's going to have a, a, a huge impact as we get into the 70s 
But the other thing we see, though, what's what's so powerful about Ali, I think, is that Ali got someone like a a, a, a Martin Luther King to move. And 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 I'll do this in two segments here. There's this one here, right here on the left. This is Cassius X, and this is King in 1964, right? Who who's one of many people who does not like a young Muhammad Ali, does not like that he changed his name. In fact, the majority of, of white newspapers don't start calling him Muhammad Ali until 1971. The majority of black newspapers, they'll wait till around 1960, uh, mid-1967, 1968. So you'll still see black newspapers in 1968 call him Clay, right? So it's not like it's a black white divide. There are a lot of folks who, who are upset with him. And, and what we'll see here, and King says this right here, when Cassius Clay joined the black Muslims and started calling himself Cassius X, he became the champion of racial segregation. That is what we are fighting. I think Cassius should spend more time proving his boxing skill and do less talking. Right? This is a very shut up and play, Cassius Clay, and he won't even call him, right? <clears throat> Muhammad Ali. But Three years later, three years later, he is celebrating Muhammad Ali as somebody who gave him the courage, right, to speak out against Vietnam War. So, so Ali is one of the first famous people to speak out against the war. And that's important because for a while, it, it seemed like it's a consensus war, right? 64, 65, and then you have young kids college students speaking out against it. And then someone like Ali really gives them credibility, gives them voice. And then 67, King comes out of it. And, and when King comes out against the war, you know, he loses a lot of support, right? From, from the federal government to people in the movement. But I think it's the power of Ali to really shift King. And if you can shift King, you definitely can shift a lot of young Americans. We'll see that play out, especially in athletics. But here, I, on, the, on the far right, I just love this. This is one of these undertold stories that, that King and Ali, this is them coming to Detroit to, to have a get out the vote campaign, right? And I'm, I'm highlighting this just because what we went through in the last election, you have the uh, athletes get involved in more than a vote. Here you have the most famous athlete ever. Here you have the most famous civil rights leader ever coming together to get our vote campaign in Cleveland to elect Carlos Stokes, who will be the first uh, black mayor in a major city in America. Now, Gary Indiana will get a black mayor at the same, same time, but Carl Stokes, you know, will be the first one. And, 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 you know, Stokes, if you know, or if you don't know, played, a, played an important role for, for black athletes. Um, he's the, <clears throat> there at the Ali Summit, right, when black athletes like a Jim Brown or Bill Russell, Ali or John Wooten got together to talk about Ali, um, going after the draft he helps out other cleveland brown black athletes when they're they're fighting for more money so he plays an integral role in the black athletic experience and he happens to be the first uh black mayor in a major city uh but all they will get young people to to change right young black athletes and, and so no longer is it just simply and hey, we're going to talk about civil rights we're going to revolt for the system if we don't get what we want and we see this i i now this is from college athletes and there's more than there's roughly 35 protests uh, amongst college athletes between 60 around 67 to, to 70 um two of them happen <clears throat> major ones happen here in michigan this one on the left is michigan state the black athletes during spring training uh boycotted um a practice they actually walked out of practice right after mlk was assassinated um because Michigan State, who had no black coaches at that time, thought it would be okay thing to uh, have practice after MLK is assassinated, right? When the war, you know, America's in mourning and, and black Americans uh, specifically are mourning. And, and it was a clear sign to them that there's a problem here. And so they, they boycotted it. And this is going to happen throughout again. It's going to happen at UTEP, like these black athletes boycotted that year. Um, the next year, if you're into Big Ten football, Iowa, every black player from Iowa quits the team in, in spring training. During the season, every black player from Indiana will, will, will get kicked off the team. Back up to Iowa, they get kicked off the team. Indiana gets kicked off the team. Washington football players will get kicked off the team. Um, and famously, Wyoming 14, will, they'll, they'll kick off the players in 69. But here, you have athletes actually <clears throat> leaving the team if they don't get their way. And they're working with uh, students on campus. And so Actually, because of what the black athletes did here at Michigan State, Michigan State actually hires a black coach. 
And you'll see more of that in college football, not a uh, black assistant coach, not a head coach. And, and so what's going to happen is because of these, a lot of these protests is that schools will finally for the first time hire black assistant coaches. Um, it takes a long time to actually get them to move up to the race, the head coaches, but obviously Michigan State has one now. Even Western Michigan in, 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 in your neck of the woods, um, black athletes there protested. And this comes from June uh, 1968. Essentially, they're protesting the lack of not only black coaches, but the fact that these athletes are just used. Um, and, and, and so they're, they're threatening, again, to boycott. Um, and the part of what they want is they, they want better academic counseling, right? They want better... Uh, more scholarships to, to black athletes and they want black coaches hired on campus right so this this really this bug this revolt really of, of these young black athletes this rebellious spirit of a Muhammad Ali like goes throughout all of college athletes and famously it will go to these college athletes John Carlos and Tommy Smith I think we tend to forget that they are students at San Jose State when this happens the 1968 Olympics and in fact the previous year 1967 when these, these athletes um, vote to boycott the Olympics. Uh, getting Ali reinstated as the champion is one of their list of demands. Um, but I love these quotes, right? And, and this is Tommy Smith, who's in the middle right there at the saying, but I am prepared to do just that if I will help my people, if it will help my people gain full equality in this country. Say, look, I might lose my prestige. I might not get this Olympic medal, but if my people get full equality, it's worth it. And this quote from John Carlos after, so John Carlos at the end says, tell the white people of America and all over the world that if they don't seem to care for the things black people do, they should not go to see black people perform. It's this idea that a lot of black, with the black athletes, there's this awakening, this consciousness of you celebrate us only as athletes, but when we speak out, you're mad at us. You tell us to shut up and play or shut up and dribble to use terms from today. And, and what John Carlos is very boldly and powerfully saying is like, look, if you don't like us talking about this, just don't, don't even bother, right? Just, just leave us alone. We'll, we'll continue to do our sports. We'll continue to speak out, but you don't need to be there for that. And I think this with the combination of Ali, the combination of what you see with athletes, uh, college athletes speaking out, boycotting practices, leaving institutions, it is the, really the peak of not only just the athlete, athlete, but the revolt of the black athlete. And then something changes, right? I think part of it is, besides the punishment we see with Ali or John Carlos or Tommy Smith, obviously Kurt Flood when he challenged the baseball system is part of, let's say, a victory of Kurt Flood is that it works. Like salaries get higher, right? And so once you get into the 70s, there's a couple of things where athletes are saying, man, we're not going to do this anymore. Once salaries get higher, you know, Kurt Flood fights for free agency. Eventually they, they win in baseball. Oscar Robinson will do the same thing in basketball. And so now all of a sudden you're not losing 60,000 a year. You're perhaps losing a million. Now it's, 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 you know, something like a James Ford just recently turned down a $50 million contract. Right. So these salaries make you think about it. Right. Because a lot of times these people in the past had two jobs. They weren't making any money. Right. So they were willing to risk a little more. The other part about the finally black athletes uh, post OJ Simpson, not 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 ninety post ninety four OJ Simpson, but sixty eight OJ Simpson that that people love, they're starting to get endorsements. What happens once you start to get endorsements is a lot of these athletes are listening to their company more than their community, right? They don't want to mess mess that up. It's it's someone like a Jordan say Republicans buy sneakers too. And, and um, shout out to the Black Athlete Podcast. Check it out. We have actually an episode on Harvey Gantt, who Jordan said that about instead of like helping Gantt in his uh, lectures. We have a whole podcast on, on Gantt as a, as a politician. And then the other thing what happens with college athletes is these one-year renewable contracts. That happens in 73. Until there, if you sign a, um, a scholarship, we call them contracts. If you sign a scholarship, it's four years guaranteed. But once it becomes one year renewable in 1973, that means it has to be renewed every year. And if you're quote unquote misbehaving or you're speaking out, the coach can get rid of you. And so a lot of these guys aren't willing to risk that, right? To lose their one opportunity to get a quality education. And so you'll see a size. Now, it doesn't mean that people are completely quiet, right? We have someone like uh, Craig Hodges who, who, who famously, this quotes caused out uh, uh, George Bush in 1991, after the Bulls win, they, he goes to the White House and gives Bush a, a, a letter really um, talking about the problems of civil rights. 
um, and, and, and also the, the, the Gulf War. And then calls out Michael Jordan for not really talking about police brutality um, after the Rodney King, not only Rodney King beating him in 1991, but the South Central riots in 1992. Um, one of the things that Hodges wanted to do was actually, he talks about it in his book, he wanted to boycott a game, um, boycott the finals in 1991. So those are Lakers and Bulls finals, and he regrets that. But after 1992, he's, he's gone. He's gone, right? He's a three-point champion. He's, a, he's an integral part of the Chicago Bulls championship, but the ABA gets rid of him, and he never comes back. And that's a message to others, right? You'll see eventually the same thing that will happen with Mahmoud Abu Raouf, also known as Chris Jackson. That's him praying their national anthem at a point. He refused to uh, go on the court for the national anthem. He gets in trouble, and then his compromise was was to pray. Uh, he was booed. Like, if you if you watch highlights of this, he gets booed at this time, um, and then eventually, two years later, he's out of the league. A little bit different between him and athletes that, you know, NBA players have two year, or they have, or not two year, they have guaranteed contracts. And so you can't just get rid of them. You still got to pay them. So, but you'll see his play. He gets traded from the Nuggets and his, his playing time kind of declines. But someone like Tony Smith Thompson, a D3 division, uh, division uh, three basketball player who will protest during the national anthem, take all kinds of, flip, gets, you know, gets hate mail. Um, but again, these are just a few people. It's not until post-2012 where you'll see these black athletes again uh, be part of this, what we'll call the civil rights movement. This is really what we call the revolt of the, the black athlete. For me, it starts here with this picture of hoodies. This is the Miami Heat team. They're all wearing hoodies, and, and they're doing it to support Trayvon Martin, who, who was murdered uh, by, by George Zimmerman that year. And I think it's so powerful because – you have a LeBron James, you have a D Wade, you have a Chris Brosh, major stars, major stars speaking out. And once they do that, that opens up the opportunities for others, right? LeBron's doing it. He's not getting in trouble, right? Nike's not coming at him. In fact, Nike has embraced this idea of the activist athlete, right? They have commercials about it. Kaepernick, they sell Kaepernick stuff. And so this is the evidence of that, right? And there's very similar to what we saw when we talked about Foy Patterson and other athletes speaking out. What happens to these athletes? They do it because they have cover. This is this large Black Lives Matter movement. You see it in this kind of post-George Floyd moment, right? Two, uh, 2020, where, where because you have this large protest movement, more people are comfortable. They get their athletes again are being called out uh, of these moments. And then you have these kind of these points with whether it's Trayvon Martin's killing, uh, Mike Brown, Eric Gardner, that athletes feel like, man, I have to say something. I can't have this $100 million con dollar contract and not be part of this movement. And so, so the movement will gain from 2012 on, we'll, 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 we'll pick up again. This quote is from LeBron, 2017. It says, no matter how much money you have, no matter how famous you are, no matter how many people admire you, you being Black America is tough. we got a long way to go for us as a society and for us as African Americans that we feel equal in America. To me, that's very similar to what Jackie Robinson said, right? That very least of these approach when he says, look, I'm not free till, till all Black people are free. And here you have LeBron James saying that 50 plus years later um and then again this will pick up you'll have athletes right derrick rose who at one point is is the nba or mvp is a superstar right now he plays for detroit pistons he has an i can't breathe shirt on here and at one point almost uh, a lot of nba players are wearing i can't breathe shirts you have in 2015 black college athletes from missouri all of them says you know what? we're going to boycott this potential game if, if the school president's not fired and the school president gets fired um ADs, athletic directors across America were worried about so what happens if other black athletes follow suit. You know, um, none do after that, surprisingly. Um, but, but again, it shows you the power. So the, the president actually was fired in the game uh, with BYU, which was about to make the school about a million dollars goes on. So these athletes have power. They just haven't used it uh, yet. And then you have the WNBA players speaking out. And, and one of the, I think, to me, if we're doing a compare and contrast, the major difference between the 60s and now is that there are more, there are black women speaking out. It's not that they, they weren't speaking out. It's that, you know, pre-Title IX, there's not a lot of black athletes. The track athletes like a, a Wilma Rudolph, right, or Wyoming Tyus, and their coach is, is, is really preaching for them to, 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 to stay silent, right, to not get involved. On the right, you'll see this black lady. It's Rose Robinson. She's really one of the first 
the athletes we say will revolt for the system. In 1958, in fact, she, she refused to uh, participate in a track meet between the U.S. and Russia because she, doesn't, she didn't want her, her country to use her. Um, she didn't agree with the politics, right? That is to say, there's a Jim Crow in, in our society, but my country is using me to show off American democracy, and I'm not going to do that. Here, this picture, she's being wheeled out of jail because she's on a hunger strike. Uh, she actually goes to jail for refusing to pay her taxes. Uh, very few people know about that, and, and hopefully you know, one day her story gets told in the same right way as, as an Ollie or Jack Robson. On the left, you have members of the Minnesota Lynx. Uh, they're wearing shirts to say, change start with us. Kind of building on the black, it's Fernando Castillo and Alton Sterling. Um, they protest um, before Kaepernick, right? They're protesting and they're supporting Black Lives Matter and they're getting a lot of flack. But, but what we'll see is that from this moment on, WNBA players have really been part of the leaders of this movement of the activist athlete. Um, and then you'll see just a couple months, uh, months after these WNBA players protest, Kaepernick fam famously kneels, right? So he sits down first and then he starts to kneel. And one of the things he says, we get a few quotes from him, but one of the things he says, I'm not going to stand to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. And this is so powerful. Now, Cap will, as we all know, will lose his career um, after this. So he gets to play this season, and then no other team will, will bring him back. But what it does is it, it starts a movement of, of other athletes, other football players kneeling. Um, basketball players didn't do it until 2020, but just because con it's in their contract that they, that they can't do it. But for some reason, 2020, during the bubble, they, they can do that. But Kaepernick... I think the most important part about him is is that he's it's it's his way that he's not only attacking police brutality, but he's now become a symbol. Just like John Carlos and Tommy Smith raising their fists in the air became a symbol, kneeling has become a symbol. It's 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 internationally recognized what it is. It's a, it's a protest against injustice. I think that's so powerful, right? I think it's more powerful than actually watching. I wish he could still play. He's a great quarterback, one of my favorite players to watch. But this idea that you have become a symbol of a movement for justice is powerful. And then in 2020, I know we're running out of time, this happens. Now, these are two images I combined together. On the one hand, this is George Floyd uh, being murdered um, in May 2020. On the, on the right is a political cartoon from the Michigan Chronicle, a black newspaper in Detroit. And it's the same thing. It's an officer kneeling on a, on a person's neck and, you know, and, and they're, they're protesting police brutality. So if you ever get a chance to look at the Michigan Chronicle, tons of protests of police brutality because it continues to happen. But this moment really changed everything in sport. And I think that Cap in 2016, 2017, there's this movement of black athletes and athletes in general just protesting, starting to die out. And then post George Floyd, we're in this whole new moment, right? Because nobody's working at that time. Right, so you have the George Floyd murder and it's going on TV. You have the pandemic. And so you'll start to see a lot of athletes like a, a Giannis of Milwaukee Bucks or a Trey Young or Jalen Brown be part of these protests. But then you'll also start to see, again, we talked about black women and WNBA players at the forefront, a Renee Montgomery who plays for the Atlanta Dream says, you know what? I'm so committed to this cause of, of, of activism, of social justice, that I'm willing to risk my career. I'm going to sit out the 2020 season. No male athlete did that. A couple of athletes worried that, oh, you know, if we go into the bubble, what's going to happen? Can we still be committed to, to the civil rights movement? Renee Montgomery was like, it's not even worth it to me. Now what happened, what these athletes learned as we wrap up here is that, look, when the athletes went into the bubble, Oh, real quick before the athletes go into the bubble here, WNBA players on this path. Again, this is so important to this day, right? Because LaFleur is in a runoff. There, there's these athletes who say, you know, just vote, vote, vote for Warnock, right? And, and a lot of people say it started to switch, right? The narrative in this uh, election here, the Senate race in Georgia, more folks are starting to pay attention. That's the power the athlete protests had and WNBA had. But if we come back to the bubble, playing in the bubble as these athletes, what they realized that, you know, you can wear, you can have Black Lives Matter on the court. You can have someone's name on your jersey or a slogan on your jersey. 
but it doesn't have an impact, right? After a couple couple games, and after what happened in Wisconsin, right, with with uh, Jacob Blake, where he shot uh, seven times in the back by the police, the Milwaukee Bucks said, "You know, enough is enough. We've tried this, right? We've tried this protest. We've tried the slogan. We've tried the the t-shirts. We're on strike." And the WNBA, the NBA some major league baseball teams some mls teams went on strike and the power of that strike people wonder what would happen are they going to go back to play the power of that strike was this they got a commitment from ownership sports owners to open up arenas to allow people to vote you can find that with lebron james organization more than a vote it shifted the election we're talking about folks who have been their voters, the vote has been suppressed. Maybe even to use the word disenfranchised. It allows 300,000 people to vote. More than an athlete helped pay for folks to be able to vote who still have what I call a tax, but had to pay debt for being in jail. What these athletes did in these last few months has changed the American political system and has really set a tone for other athletes to come after them. I know I'm running out of time. I thank you. Here's the last thing. I think we'll open up. This is the shameless plug. These are the books we're talking about. So you have, I fight for a living, which is about boxing. You have, we will win the day. I don't know, Kevin, do we open this up for questions? Is there a chat function? Do I yeah. stop sharing my screen? What's going on here? No, we can, we can keep the screen share up. I actually typed in the chat. If you have a question and you want me to share or ask a, Dr. Moore, I will, but if you want to ask him a question directly, just indicate that in the chat and I will unmute you. Um, one of the things that, and I'll start just to let people think a little bit. Um, I just want to say one of the, the, one of the things I found really interesting about your presentation that I heard in the summer at the, the Society for American Baseball Research was the role that black journalists played in this story, and I thought that was really fascinating. I mean, I know you have not a lot of time, but can you share, you know, the role of black journalists during this time, uh, mostly in, you know, during Jackie Robinson and uh, uh, the sixties? Yeah, first of all, my my son, although he's told not to come down here, he never listens, so he's here, everybody. Oh, and hey, his, how you his, his, <laughs> He can't hear you because I have the headphones on, but oh, his middle name is actually, it's Robinson, so he is named after Jackie Robinson, but but the black press was was so important. I actually have a chapter um, on just solely on the black press and what they did. And, and it's, it's not only just encouraging people to get involved in the movement, but to me, what it's, it's, it's fighting to get people to in, for integration, right? It is leading, um, you know, 40,000 people protesting the lack of black players or black player on the Washington football team. It is, Jim Hall, who's a famous, uh, or not famous, he's a black sports writer for, for New Orleans, leading I th what, what I call the biggest sustained boycott of black fans. In New Orleans, there's this uh, minor league baseball team, the Pelicans at that time. And, and they are uh, part of the Pittsburgh Pirates organization, but they refuse to have black players on the team. And so what, what Hall did with his um, platform is get black fans to boycott the games. And this boycott lasted four years. And what you would see in a newspaper is, is the ownership complaining, like, we can't go on without black fans, right? They make up so much in the South on these minor league baseball fans, so much of, of the, the revenue that when there's a boycott, they, they go under. And so you'll see teams in the South in the late 50s and 60s go under because black fans start to boycott. And that's because the black press is telling them, don't go to these games. That was just, I, I was really fascinated by that. It made me go back and look at, look up a ton of black reporters during that time. So I thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so um, Rudy has a question and I'm going to unmute him. So uh, let's see, Rudy, go ahead. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Dr. Moore, it's good sure. to see you face to face. It's, uh, I don't yeah. think we've ever connected face to face. No, no, no. How's it going? It's going good. Thanks so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. And um you know, I, I really enjoyed reading I Fight for a Living, and, and as you know, my, my research is on, on boxing and performance of, of activism and, and radical self-expression and ring entrances in boxing. So I was curious, with, with the talk about the uh, revolt of the Black Athlete too, um, discussions about that, building on Harry Edwards' work, what, where, where do you see fighters like, for example, uh, Floyd Mayweather and um, 
and, and Deontay Wilder uh, fitting within that conversation of the revolt to the black athlete because their, their acts of dissent and resistance don't always seem to be communicated in very overt fashion. But, but I was curious to get your thoughts as a historian, but also as someone who, who studies um, dissent and activism within, within contemporary spaces of, of athletes. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so to me, Floyd, like I'm, I'm from Grand, I'm in Grand Rapids. Floyd's from here, so I can't say too much. But I, but I say, you know, Floyd is, um, he dissents in the way that he's not, he's unapologetic for who he is, right? But he's after, he's for Floyd Mayweather and Floyd Mayweather only. Right. So you never get the sense that he's he's publicly for others. Now, he might do stuff like out here. He'll he'll support the local high school and, and buy them jerseys and stuff like that. And and I believe a couple of years ago when the pools shut down, he funded, you know, a swimming program and stuff like that. But he's not like he's not like an Ali or anything like that. Right. But so the descent for him is more of a Jack Johnson on Floyd Mayweather and you deal with it. Right. And, and it's made him. A, a half a billion dollars right and and wilder though like i like wilder now wilder's kind of wild and 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 he throw a punch but he can't box but but he seems more of a person who right who's understanding right who of black lives matter and is willing to speak up for black lives matter i i, I even think like to that 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 gift of him saying to this day right. is is part of a larger conversation of him talking about justice but he's still like it's just a gift now like it's just a joke right um and and so so like i think they carry the mantle but you know as as you know boxers you study like even some like a oscar or or um or or i believe you know some like a vargas right who who maybe it's not necessarily the black fighters that we look to but it's some of these other fighters that that are going to carry this mantle to to talk about maybe um if we're talking about the 90s, what's going on with California and immigration policies or, or, or immigration at large. So, so I think the boxers have a role to play. I just also think that, you know, someone like a, you know, a Terrence Crawford or something, they're still, they're just been taught to be into themselves. And, and it's such a individual thing that, that it's really hard to see other boxers get involved in, in part of this movement. Right but, but you do see local fighters uh, from like a Ferguson, I forget his name, that, that, so we'll talk, we'll talk about Mike Brown when it was, you know, time to talk about Mike Brown. But in, just in general, you know, some of these big names like a Javante Davis, you don't expect that from them. Right, right. Cool. Thank you so much. Yes. Sorry, I muted myself. We have a question from Annie. I'm going to unmute her. Okay, Annie, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um. Go ahead, Annie. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, I have a, a couple questions. Um, one is kind of specific. Um, I, I had a friend who is no longer living, but he was born in 1919, um, same as Jackie, and he played on some of the teams that used to play against the Globetrotters. Um, and he used to tell me some about that. And um, uh, it was just interesting. He talked about it more on a personal level, but, um, or kind of just what it was like being there. Um, but I'm just wondering uh, about the Globetrotters. I, I, you know, as a kid, you know, I always loved them. I kind of am still interested in them, but do they have any role in this or what, how do they fit into this scene? Um, and my other question is just uh, hearing your, a wonderful history over this period, it kind of makes me think, um, okay, some of the specifics have changed, but some of the general issues and things haven't changed a bit. Um, I just wondered what your maybe kind of over overview of that is, or what, what is your kind of summary over what, how, how have we improved or not over this period? So thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question about the Globetrotters. Um, so the Globetrotters, I think their role was always more of, uh, man, how do I say this without being rude? Their role was more of that, that just, just kind of perform thing. And, and, and that's even the way they performed, right? To, to really soften up uh, this image, or, you know, quote, unquote, soften up this image of, of, of black folks. And one of the things that they would say is like, we had to play that way, right? So 
the racist, like when we're playing in the South or our racist fans and wherever we are in the North wouldn't want to hurt us. Right. And so, but it, for a lot of people, they saw it as a menstrual show, but, but on a global level, right. They're named the globe chargers. The United States government saw them as, as really important to showing that to the rest of the world, especially, you know, as, as these nations post-World War II start to decolonize and most of them are, you know, Africa, um, that there's opportunity in the United States. And so the United States would send the Globetrotters or sponsor the Globetrotters and other athletes like Althea Gibson or Bill Russell over to other countries and, and to show them, right, that, look, we might have Jim Crow, but look at these, the opportunities that you have, right? And so the Globetrotters played a, a, a role in that, right, that, that they got to show that the United States was, was not as bad as advertised because if it was, then how do we – have this success right and they're they're very 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 famous in, in that way um in terms of like i'm glad in that second part that you recognize that that there hasn't been a lot of there's changes but there's not a lot of changes and that's how i set this up to kind of drop those nuggets right drop those nuggets about police brutality or get out and vote kind of stuff right because because there are changes right you have the civil rights act of 64 voter rights Act of 65 housing in 68 but you still have these these fights, whether it's economic rights, whether it's police brutality. That's why I, I paired Cap and, and Jackie Robinson. The vote, to me, one of the most interesting things is is one of the largest movements of black athletes coming together is happens with Jim Brown in 66. We call it now the Black Economic Union. But it's essentially more than 100 black athletes getting together, like Jim Brown, uh, Bill Russell, uh, even Kareem was part of this. And, and really fighting for economic rights and, and, and helping funding and training small businesses, helping black folks get loans, right? Because they said, look, we have civil rights, we have voting rights, economic rights and opportunities. This is going to get us freedom. But now if we get, we get to 2020, right? 2020, the largest group is a group more than athletes who are coming together on voting rights. So to me, it shows you that while there's changes, not much has changed because you know, in 60, you're fighting for economic opportunity, thinking that this is enough. But now in 2020, you're still dealing with voter suppression, right? And it kind of shows you how much I, actually as a society, we've, we've kind of progressed, right? The fact that we're still fighting for the vote. Any other last chance for questions? If you have a question, just indicate it in the chat. Um, Dr. Moore, this has been a wonderful discussion and I'm um, super excited you took the time to do this for us. Um, the book's excellent. Um, I know you can get it in all major um, uh, booksellers. Uh, I think the library, and I'm pretty sure the library has got it on order, so it should be in our collection to check out. But um, again, thank you so much. I know that I'm happy that the last, I feel like the last question there would be a good time to stop because it's a good point for us to think about what we heard today and how history unfortunately repeats itself, but um, there's, you know, still, still the fight for equality and equity with, uh, you know, the NBA players this year. And again, everyone, I tell you, um, the podcast is great. It's, it's a must listen for me every week. And you just get, if you enjoy the, the history you learned tonight, um, you'll enjoy that that podcast as well. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Moore. And I hope that we get to hear from you again in the future. Hope to bring you down to Kalamazoo next time. <laughs> I mean, uh, and when this uh, pandemic is over, but uh, thank you so much. Right. Uh, yeah, now thank you. If you guys want to reach out, uh, my Twitter handle is at LouMore12. Uh, my website is proflumore.com. Um, yeah, so, so feel free to reach out if you, if you have further questions and, and visit your local record store at Satellite Records. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Yeah, next time you come down, let me know. <laughs> right. Okay, I will. All right, thanks. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good night, everyone. All right, bye.